Okay, here comes part two of liberal Christians versus conservative Christians on middle ground. Totally, as individuals, as Americans, I think you have rights. However, I have to go based off of the Bible, and the Bible equates homosexuality to sexual immorality. And so, I, I care about you guys as, as people. That, that's, not gonna, that's not gonna make me justify. I, I know that you mentioned like murders and suicide rates. I, I, I don't agree with any of that, and I think that's terrible. But why do you think those are happening? You can no longer say, I, that's horrible what's happening over there, because this theology is the basis of that suicidal ideation in many cases. It is the basis of transphobia in many cases. If you see all of this atrocious pain we're causing the LGBTQ plus community, then we need to look at the plank in our own eye and say, wait, why is this happening? There's a ver- I'll pause it for a second. <laughs> I mean, I- Mm-hmm. According to Paul, which we'll talk about another guy coming in a second, according to Paul, um, people who hold the view that you have go to hell. That is to say, they do not inherit the kingdom of God. So the Apostle Paul, if he showed up, and I think Jesus would have the same view, they would show up and talk to her and say, your theological view is the foundation of a lot of people who are in hell right now. You should stop saying that. Whether they kill themselves or not, your theology led them straight to hell. That road was wide and easy. And I told you the road to salvation, to the kingdom of God is narrow and hard. I told you it was. And you made it broader and broader and broader so people's feelings weren't hurt and so they won't be harmed. In your understanding, well, because you're defining it by your understanding. You should not have done that, Jesus would say. You should have done it my way, because I'm the authority. I am the authority, not you, not your feelings, and not their feelings. My feelings are hurt all the time in Christianity. Jesus in the early church said things like, I'm greedy. Uh, Jesus said, in, just the day I preached on this, Jesus said in Mark 7, out of the heart flows all these things that defile a person. Well, I, most, I, several of those things I resonate with. Well, darn, I'm a defiled person and hurt my feelings. Do I go kill myself because of it? No, because killing myself has nothing to do with Jesus holding the belief of something. There are millions of people around the, maybe billions around the planet, who also would agree with Jesus on those things that defile a person. If billions of people believed with Jesus that greed and all these things are defile a person, and that, that can send a person to hell, they deserve to be punished, I still wouldn't go kill myself. Let me say it this way, if every human being on the planet agreed with Jesus, society meant the world. All said, David, you are wrong and your view can send you to hell. I still wouldn't kill myself. I still wouldn't. And I would not demand they change their theology. I'd say is, huh, why do they have that view? Why did Jesus have that view? And who does Jesus think he is? Because that's the only question that matters. Who does he think he is? There's a verse that mentions all of the people who won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And I can talk about what Leviticus says about homosexuality or the people who engage in that. But I just base off as Christians, if our goal is to get to heaven, I know that if I'm a drunk, I know if I'm a fornicator, I know if I'm an adulterer, if I'm homo living a homosexual lifestyle, I will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what the Bible says. The word homosexuality is not even entered into biblical texts until probably like the 1900s. In the original okay. text, Arsenikoitai and Malakoi are in our English rendition, Correct. it says homosexuality, Correct. but those literally translate to pedophilia. It's Correct. a relationship between an older man and his young son. So the verses that say a man should- Absolutely wrong. Go, please learn Greek. This kind of junk, I hear this all the time, that's absolutely false just false that's just gibberish and then the guy goes that's correct you're wrong I mean this is basic Greek look up the words and figure out that's just nonsense and notice how when he says homosexuality this term wasn't brought up until like the 1900s that's exactly right of course who gives a rep the point is not whether or not a term was introduced and that's exactly right we've just changed the subject she brought up the point that it says explicitly in 1 Corinthians 6 9 and 10 what they put on the screen it says in other places too that these are particular sins that prohibit a person. You go to Ephesians 5 when Paul says, be sure, you can be sure of this, 
that the sexually moral, the greedy, these people, he says, will not inherit the kingdom of God in our Christ Jesus. They won't. You can be sure of that. Well, okay, well, either he's delusional or he's right. That has nothing to do with whether it's homosexual, or whether the term was invented, and it was invented. The question is, she was on it, the Greek. What do those Greek terms mean? They don't mean pedophilia. No, they do not. It means the weak partner and the active partner. Those terms were used for people who liked passive sex, that is the penis going in the anus, and those who like to receive it, those who like to give it, and those who like to receive it. And that's what Paul says, he addresses both. He has, says nothing about pedophilia, nothing about children, nothing about boys, none of that. And this guy has a answer about that. Shall not sleep with another man, for it is an abomination that there's no word for homosexuality in that. It's just no dude sleep with other dude. I, I can see how you can see that relating to First Timothy passage. But if you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it's clearly in context. It's talking about, quote unquote, unnatural relations. It doesn't say homosexual, but it's talking about men having, committing acts with other men. Yeah, well, the, the problem with that is that, so in Romans, that's Paul writing. Right. Um, and so Paul that's God writing. Yes. No, it's Paul writing. No, it's, it's God. So, 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 well, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. So, so Paul, Paul, Paul wrote letters to churches. Right. I, I respect you what you did, but God's you're voice. clearly saying that it's not the same thing. No, no, no. You didn't let me finish. Okay, cause you, finish. Sorry. Um, the text says natural affection. Well, my natural affection is not towards a woman. My natural affection is towards a man. There are dividing. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. See, I, I, maybe it sounds disrespectful. I don't mean it to be. I don't think he really cares, but go back and read Romans 1. It does not say natural affections. It does not say that. It doesn't. So, I'm not, in fact, I'm not even going to tell you what it says. I want you to go to read Romans 1 yourself. It does not say that. But secondly, when it talks about what is natural, that has nothing to do with a person's orientation. Though the ancient people had a concept of that. I've talked about this in other podcasts, other sermons, other places. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, what I'm saying is his understanding that it feels natural to me is this, therefore, I don't fit the category, has nothing to do with Paul's theology. Almost everyone agreed, Greeks, Romans, Jews, that it was not natural for men to put a penis in an anus because those don't go together. Specifically for Judaism, they said that so did, particularly the Stoics, the Roman philosophers at the time, they were very popular. The Stoics said very much, they made arguments based on nature. Jews said the exact same thing, they just added another component, which the more authoritative. That's back to Genesis, of course. Their assumption is God made male and female, and these male and female joined together to have children. So procreation is the chief goal. So it is unnatural based on God's design. You might want to say it's it's undesigned. It doesn't matter if you feel like it comes from within you. Coming from within you doesn't mean it's natural. That's not Paul's point whatsoever. Go read Romans 1, but that has nothing to do with it. Things in the Bible and progressives want to get rid of that because they want to focus on God loves you, accepts you, and puts his arms around you. But in the process have also watered down the gospel, also uh, deleted some things that they know what the Bible says, and because we don't want to cast people away. Mm. So I, I love that heart, but I think in the process of watering down the gospel, you set the bar so low that do they even see the real God? You have to be very careful when we talk about the literalism of the Bible, because if we do that, then basically everyone in this room is sinning because we have mixed tweeds on. Do you know the context of Leviticus? Yes, I know the context. Well, why not allow for context in Leviticus, but want, not context? Talk, we well, no, what I'm saying context. is Leviticus, the law that came, was for the people of Israel when they were rescued from the captivity of Egypt. But we see in Jeremiah 31, 31, that the Lord says that he will build a new covenant oh. under the house of Judah and under the house of Israel, right. which is still scripture. Right. So if we go based off of what we see in so, Exodus and Leviticus, that law is gone. But you're allowing for context and history, right. which you for don't thing, allow for. Right, for another thing, that's not fair. I've gone through. Okay, at first time I saw this, I didn't know what in the world they were talking about. Now I think I know what they're trying to say is, when they think Paul's talking about pedophilia, and then they say, see, you're ignoring that. It's not, it's, it's the context is pedophilia. Why are you applying this? If that's what she means, the assumption is right. I understand her point of view. She's just wrong. Paul's not talking about pedophilia, and he's not talking about whether or not you have a natural desire that is, it seems instinctual to you. So both of those views are just 
they're demonstrably false. That's not what Paul means, not what the language means. So because of that, since Paul is equally condemning male-to-male -male relationship, he never mentions boys, and he's condemning female-female sexual behavior, he never mentions girls either, and that's also weird in the ancient world. Most ancient authors did not talk against lesbianism. That's a modern term too. It doesn't matter if you call it lesbian, call it female for me, female. That's what Paul says. That's fine. Use those terms if you want to. Uh, the point is both of those things are equal. So context does matter. That's why you need to read it carefully and read the languages carefully. And it does matter what Jesus said. Jesus said, so for example, in the context of divorce, Matthew 19, Jesus asked about divorce and the point there, but he assumed something that every single Jew assumed, and that was back to Genesis 1. Having you read from the beginning, God the Father, as he adds, God, made them both male and female. And so Jesus never, ever, 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 ever would have thought that male and male can have a beautiful, glorious relationship, or whatever the words are, uh, or female to female ever. It couldn't have happened. He would never have believed. I've gone through some sort of conversion therapy myself, although they called it counseling, to serve as a leader or to serve in different departments. And I always questioned, are divorced people able to serve and do things? And it's not really a big of a deal in most churches, whereas a lot of churches, they have a statement of faith that says if you if you disagree with our um, marriage or like the traditional marriage model, you cannot serve. I never heard any pastor telling someone who's divorced to go back to their ex-husband or ex-wife. Like they say it's the same level of sin, but how come these people are like okay and these people are not? So that's the problem I see. I'm not gonna be able uh, Very good point. Very good point, very good question. She hasn't met me because I have told people to go back to their ex-husband or wife if they can. Not if they're already remarried because you're gonna end another divorce. So, I, but, so she hasn't met me, I've met her. That's a very good point. And the point, of course, the implicit question is, she didn't say this, I'm putting words, I'm going to the next step, which is to say, the follow-up question, because this is very common, is what moral prescriptions in the Bible are morally obligatory for us Christians today? What moral prescriptions of the Bible are morally uh, perfunctory or necessary for us today? What do we have the moral duty to obey? And so when he says, like, you're wearing different kind of clothes, it's just irrelevant. The reason why it's irrelevant is because we know Jesus did not reinforce that rule. This is standard in Christianity for 2,000 years. If Jesus did not restate the rule, it's not morally uh, obligatory for us today. So when she goes to the question of divorce, that's exactly right. She should be asking that question because Jesus says a lot of things about a lot of things. And the question is, do we still do this today? And that's exactly right. Now, I don't have time to say much about this right now. Jesus did believe that divorce was a bad thing in certain contexts and for certain reasons. And it's true that a lot of Christian and Christian pastors particularly, I get disappointed by them, uh, they don't know what to say about that. And it is true also that in general in my experience that people tend to pick on homosexuality more than all the other sins and they should not. Jesus talks more about idolatry and other things and, and uh, taking advantage of people and the weak and the children, more, uh, all those kind of things. He talks more about other kinds of sin. So all that to say, that doesn't mean it, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. My point is we should be just as equally outraged about sin all the time and not just pick on one or the other. And if you do say you can't, you have to agree with your traditional understanding of marriage, though I don't like traditional, I wish just said Jesus's view. Go read Matthew 19. And just. So if you disagree with Jesus, that's a big deal. And if you, the same thing about divorce, you've got to figure out exactly what it is, and that's where context matters. And uh, the, the guy, the New Testament, New Testament scholar who's done the best work on this, I think, by far, is David Enstone Brewer. David Enstone Brewer has written a lot about marriage and divorce in the New Testament, and uh, just fantastic, very, very good. I'm not gonna be a literalist here, but please don't be offended because I do admire your courage in coming out. I have to pause there. It's not about literalism. It's not about literalism, so that's why people don't understand this. So when the guy, the, the black gay man, I can't remember his name now, um, he's more than, okay, the guy with the yellow sweater on, uh, when he said, you gotta be careful what's literal, it's not about literal. Literal from the Latin, it means literally at face value, of the letter, of the letter. Literal is very problematic as a term. What we should ask the question is, you sh he should have said, we need to be careful about which moral prescriptions in the Bible we think are more moral obligatory today. Completely agree with that. Completely agree with that. But Christians have been talking about this for centuries. 
past YouTube, there are an enormous amount of books on this subject and brilliant Christian thinkers. And in general, in general, the church has agreed for almost 2,000 years at all the different branches, Jesus, everything else. If Jesus taught it, then it's morally obligatory that there's everything else, everything else. Jesus did not uphold the kashrut, the dietary restrictions. He never told people to don't eat pork. So I can eat bacon. Jesus said, he never said, make sure. Even if he himself might not have eaten bacon, he never tells his disciples. That's not his point. And I'm going to a long list of things that we no longer find uh, morally obligatory because Jesus doesn't do that. So it doesn't matter if it's literal. It matters if we are, have the moral duty to do it. But I believe homosexuals will not be in heaven. Right. I believe homosexuals, transgenders, people who break the speed limit will all go to heaven if they put their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But, but when they get to heaven, they will no longer be homosexuals. They will no longer be lawbreakers. They will no longer be drunks based on 1 Corinthians 6, Correct. verse 9. Wow. We can actually see what God's will is clearly based on what it is in heaven. I have several things. Like, I don't think breaking the speed limit is, I don't think breaking the speed limit is a sin. I know people will disagree with that. He might think, yeah, it is, David. Go to read Romans uh, 12 I just uh, and 13, I guess, rather. I, I just disagree with him on that one. But all that to say, I understand the point he's making, and I, pre I appreciate that very much. I also don't think there will be homo or heterosexuals in the world to come. I don't think we'll have sexual urges because we don't need to procreate. Why do I think that? Because my innate nature just tells me, no, because David doesn't like people to kill themselves. No, um, it's because David's a bigot and his, dad, his parents are just such punks and they hate, no. It's because Jesus said specifically when someone asked him, he said, no, don't you know your scripture? Don't you know it says that in the world to come, they'll be like the angels. They won't be married or given in marriage. They won't do that. And everybody knows, and historically, every historian knows, Jews meant they want to have babies. See, angels don't procreate, angels don't have children. Neither will we in the world to come. We won't have to worry about homosexuality, heterosexuality, lust, and so forth. Erotic love will be no more. Erotic love helps us have babies, and apparently helps homosexuals have anus stuff and lesbians do their stuff, but it's supposed to be a kind of romantic love that helps us have children. That's what makes it more pleasurable and so forth. But in the world to come, we won't have that. So when it comes to tendencies with homosexuality, that's something that I've dealt with since I was very young. However, I don't choose to identify with those tendencies that are within me. I choose to identify with what the Bible declares that I am. And are you miserable? No. No. That is so good. I heard this and I thought, oh, man, that's good stuff. And the fact that the gay man says, are you miserable and not do you think that's a sin or not tells me everything you need to know. The question is not on whether or not your being celibate is good or righteous. The question is, how do you feel about it? But don't you feel sad? Don't you feel angry that you can't put your penis in someone's anus? Don't you feel sad about that fact? Well, if you do, if you're slightly upset or you feel like you committed suicide, how you feel a little bit sad about yourself whatsoever? If you do, hey man, go for it. And that's exactly what it demonstrates. That's a very distinction between authority figures, either Jesus or my feelings. And that, there's a big difference there. There's a big difference. And this guy, I can't remember his name, the guy with the glasses and the tan jacket, gives a fantastic answer. No, not at all. You're not? No, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Could I ask a, an invasive question you can say now? <laughs> Are you bisexual? No. There is a big possibility I may never get married. Okay. There's so, a big possibility you may get, never get married because of what? Because I choose to trust in the Lord and I choose to do as the scripture says and believe as the scripture says. So do you have inclinations? To pause there, see it? <laughs> I mean, I just, I guess I'm laughing because it's such a, fa that's why I'm laughing. I'm laughing because it's a fantastic example of different understanding of what's authoritative. Everything they're asking, are you this, are you this sexuality, everything he's going to ask is irrelevant for the guy who's answering, the guy who said I had these tendencies. He's saying, Scripture's the chief authority. So when she goes, why? He should have said, Matthew 19 is why. Jesus said it's either male or female or stay married or you're a eunuch, that is your celibate. That's why, because Jesus the God-man said so. Are you really concerned, are you really confused about this? 
Have you read Matthew 19? That's why I'm doing that, because I don't, because I trust him and he's my joy. And I don't get to just say my feelings dictate where my penis goes and who I, what kind of a romantic love I have. I mean, this, he, is, he is awesome, he's right on it. And the other messages demonstrate where their authority is. And I just don't find that persuasive. And desires to like, to be with a guy. I have desires and inclinations to follow the voice of the Lord. And I, and I respect that, like, I, I honestly do. That's a lot of self-control to say basically you're down to have a life of celibacy. I, was I love that. That's a lot of self-control, which the implication is, wow. It's funny, isn't that a fruit of the Spirit, right? Have you ever read Galatians before? A fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, peace, peace and self-control. That's a basic value, a moral value of Judaism forever and Christianity for most of the time until now. Well, self-control is irrelevant. As long as you have this passion, you've got to do it. That's back to Freud and some other things. When she goes, that's a lot of self-control, he should have said, thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. You're right, that means the Holy Spirit's inside me. To be celibate, thank you so much. That means I'm being obedient to Jesus, what he said in Matthew 19. I appreciate that, thank you so much. I was kind of nervous to talk about it a little bit, but I feel like it's a topic that's a lot more in the dark when it comes to the church. And I don't know, I just feel like we need to move forward in a different approach than the way we've been going because it does break my heart seeing people committing suicide and, and hearing about some of the violent conclusions that some people's lives have gotten to. I feel like if anybody has any reason to find like an explanation for how I could get around scripture and marry a male, it just, I just can't. I, I can't, can't Could come I to also that. just ask you where you received that message for the first time? Why does that matter? Sorry, why does that matter? And see, the point is that she's trying to invalidate a belief by learning of the origin, right? That's the, called the genetic fallacy on her part. It doesn't matter where you first heard it. Just doesn't matter. This is irrelevant. Some people in church that would say like, you know, that that was a choice. And, and I realized that I had no control over what I like or what I don't like. Literally, I don't. And I can agree with you with that. I think the choice comes in is choosing to identify with those beliefs and choosing to identify with tendencies inside of you. That's where I believe it com becomes sin. For me, I That is so stinking good. It's so good. I can't, man, I wish this guy were on billboards. I wish this guy we're on today's show, every single conceivable, you don't hear this message ever. You don't hear someone saying, no, I just want to go by what Jesus said. He said scripture. <clears throat> Man, I, this is fantastic. That's courageous. And a society that will cancel you, will kill you. She's talking about killing people. I can't, he probably got death threats after saying that. But who does he think he, who does he, people, man, people I hate people standing up for Jesus. And that's courageous what he just said and did. The other thing about when you make an argument based on someone's possible suicide rate of morality, of course, you could use that for everything. And this is where it's just, it's just nonsense. It's just, the suicide rate for sexual offenders is much higher than those who are not. That is to say pedophiles particularly. Pedophiles in particular, their suicide rate's higher. Okay, well, never mind. We should all think pedophilia is good. Why? Because if not, they'll kill themselves or they're likely. And it's your belief that sets the foundation for that. Who, who would say that outside of a crazy person or maybe a normal naturalist? I mean, wh who would say such a thing? But there, you say, no, that's different. Of course it's, no, it's not actually, right? You see, it's exactly the same thing because if I interview a pedophile and they say, my instincts told me that, my desires, I knew when I was little, 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 I've always been attracted to babies. I like the penis of a baby. I've always liked it. I don't know, I, I, for a long time I struggled. They even put me into therapy. They tried to get that out of me and it did not work because I still to this day, I still, I can't wait to see a baby's penis. And I tried my heart, I tried, and the whole group would go, well, what are you gonna do about it? Hey, listen, listen, you know, I'm not a man who likes boy, baby penis. And the woman should say that. She said, I'm not a man. I can't say anything about this. I shouldn't say one word. And then someone else said, no, it's a beautiful, lovely thing that you like the penis of a baby. It's a beautiful, lovely thing, and you're so gentle with them when you do that. You could use the exact same vocabulary words for that, and you would notice that most, and I'm sure that time is coming. We're not there yet. Right now, that's still disgusting.
praise Jesus is still disgusting. It's going to come a time, not too long in the future. It's absolutely, it's already coming. I've been saying this for years. Uh, I saw three different TED Talks where they were arguing for pedophilia. So it's coming next. And they'll say all the exact same arguments. Who are you to say? I love them too. It's all beautiful. And where did you first learn pedophilia was wrong? Did your parents teach you that? Man, that's so sad. We're See, they're just on the wrong side of history. We know now that that's not true. And to be compassionate, we need to support all the baby penises we can get to you because we sure don't want you to hurt yourself, right? That's what we're going to say one day. It's coming. I'm not going to say it. I'm for me, I tried to suppress that um, for years. I, you know, um, I had a girlfriend. I, I did all of these different things, and it was like, oh, no, it's a sin. It's that. But I had a revelatory moment when the church was mean to me. Put him over here, we don't want him with anybody, kick him out, do that. It wasn't, no one showed me the authentic love of Christ. And pause here for a second. I'm very sorry to hear that. I'm very sorry to hear that. That's a very sad thing. I'm sorry someone loved him. I, I was surprised to hear him say that. I thought he was gonna say, I really thought he was gonna say, uh, and the revelatory moment was I realized when I read scripture well, that my motivations were irrelevant and I shouldn't be trying to suppress my interests. Instead, what I should be doing is suppressing where my penis goes and the kind of romantic love how I express myself, like this other gentleman just said with the glasses. Instead, he's talking about, I've got to suppress these urges. I don't have them, I don't have them, and I just get a girlfriend that'll make all my desires go away. That's not the Bible either. And then I, the church is mean to me. I'm sorry they're mean to you. They are. Was Jesus mean to you? So the second you think Jesus is mean to you, you kick him out too. Well, no, because Jesus must agree with everything I do. He'll never be mean. Why? Because that's the love of Christ. He's never mean to me, which means he will never disagree with me because everything I do is right. Well, if that's true, then, I mean, what, what is the gospel? What is the, why did Jesus even come to earth? To tell us we're all good people and all your desires are good? I mean, I, the, you just follow that through logically. I can imagine the stuff he's telling his church as a senior pastor. But you know who showed me the authentic love of Christ? my friends who were gay. I had to go to counseling because of what the church did to me. And the counselor is the one who was not a Christian, helped me to understand people in the church hurt you, not God. And so because God did not hurt me, I could stand in a church and get married to a man. Because God did not hurt me, I can stand up every Sunday and preach to transgender, straight people, gay people. I can do all of that because of the authenticity of who and what I know God is. Yeah, see, right, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I hear that and I appreciate that's your view. I, I mean, I think that's dangerous and silly and ridiculous and you're leading people astray and everything, it's just silly. Your feelings and whether or not someone's mean to you or nice to you is not how morality is decided, it's just, Everything you just said, you could say for pedophiles. Every single thing. I found a group of people. You know who nice were? Other pedophiles. They weren't Christians. And it was a non-Christian pedophilic counselor who said, wait a second. You could use the, just flip, take out the way homosexual and put anything else there. And you would think, what, David, that's disgusting. That's wrong. You can't do that. Of course that's right. Because all those excuses you gave are irrelevant. Because you're talking about feelings. Our feelings can lead us astray. Our feelings can be delusional. We can we need to pay attention to our feelings, but they can be not based on reality. Not to mention, they can be just simply make us do things that are immoral. It's immoral. I felt like killing someone. It doesn't matter if you felt like it. Don't do it. To wrap up, we don't make our decisions based on feelings. We just don't. We just don't make our decisions based on feelings. Feelings can be wrong, and we don't go around other people to make sure we feel supported by our feelings. We just don't do that. I, I, just to make any sense, you can find people who... That's why I preach to a whole congregation full of rapists and pedophiles and gangsters. Why? Because they love me. They, they show the love of Christ to me. That means they accept me. They tell me I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, of course they don't think they're doing anything wrong because they themselves are in the middle of doing it. That's why people like to do things together as sin. That's why people walk in and say, hey, you want something to drink? People who drink a lot want to drink with other people. It helps assuage their guilt. They feel like they're other, and that's exactly... This, this idea of your feelings decide for you what is moral is absolutely dangerous. And this next section, they're talking about whether or not Jesus would protest for Black Lives Matter. I don't care that much about it. That's a good question. Uh, they'd say different things. I agree that in general, of course, Jesus very much would have been against 
uh, racism and killing a particular people group, of course. My own view is that I don't think uh, that the Black Lives Matter movement in particular, its ideological views are congruent with Christianity. So I absolutely would march with anybody who's arguing against racism. Absolutely I would. But it would depend on their ideological views or whether or not that jives with Christianity. If it's just, you shouldn't be racist, yeah, I'll go to march with you. Sure, if it's, okay, I'd also go to march, you shouldn't kill innocent human people. But interesting how they'll go on marches for this. Why? Because we all know it's bad to be racist. Well, why do we know that? And I'll go back to ask her and say, when did you first hear that? Who told you that was bad? See, oh, you're, oh that's sad your parents taught you that. That's so, that's unfortunate because we know nowadays it's, it's okay to do that because, you know, our earth is limited resources and we need to make sure we get rid of anybody who gets in the way of that. That includes that includes black people for some reason, white people, Jews, anybody gets the way of my resources. Um, we've learned that that's a good thing to survive. And I'm sorry your parents taught you to try to get along with people. That's just silly. You can use the same argument for historical. That's just dumb. Okay, that was part two. Part three is coming up real soon. Stay tuned. you got to subscribe because I'm going to do part three of liberal Christians versus conservative Christians on the middle ground. I'll see you as soon as I post it.